Hey folks, how you guys doing? Hope you are all having a great day today. If you haven't already entered the giveaway on my website, it ends uh, Christmas Eve 2018. If you're watching this in the future, then sorry. Uh, but I've got a huge giveaway on my website. Check it out. We're giving away a saw stop table saw, a Laguna lathe, Rockler woodworking and hardware is giving a tremendous, tremendous amount of goodies. Uh, we also have some white side router bits, a huge gift card, and a huge dovetail package from Jonathan Katz Moses. All the information is down in the description or a link to the giveaway, I should say. Click on it, enter it, and good luck. With that said, let's get into the shop tour. It's nearing the end of 2018, and my shop has changed quite a bit in 2018. That's a reoccurring theme. Um, and I think it's a good thing. I think shops uh, and, and everything in life really evolves and progresses towards improvement. Um, it, it should be that way. So lots of stuff has changed in my shop and I know that sometimes there is a little bit of envy or jealousy or just negative vibes from somebody showing off their stuff. Uh, and it's not meant to be as an arrogant or um, look what I have type of situation. It's more like a what's working for me and uh, what I have worked my butt off to get. So um, not everyone starts the same way with building a shop. Not everybody has the same background to come from. Um, hopefully you can get some ideas and inspiration from what I'm going to show you here in my shop. And instead of wishing you had something, get out there, get off your butt and earn it. It's always better that way. So with that said, oh, also I just published an article a few weeks ago about my very first shop. Um, and that's kind of interesting to look at too. So I'll have a link to it in the description below. Uh, I'm going to give you some overview stuff of the shop before I get into specifics of what's going on. So let me back up the camera and we'll get started. All right, so you can pretty much see the entire shop from this uh, angle, the majority of it anyway, minus the wall where the camera's at. Uh, this is a wide angle lens, so it makes the entire shop feel bigger than what it is. Um, everybody who's come into the shop or has seen the shop in person has said that, wow, it's smaller than what it appears to be on the videos, uh, mainly just because of the lenses used to record the videos. but. It's, it's not a small shop by any means, but it's, it's not massive. It's, it's 20 and a half feet by 20 and a half feet square, and the ceiling is 10 feet off of the ground. It doesn't matter what size shop any one of us has, we pretty much fill it up, and then every one of us wishes we had a bigger space. Very, very rarely do you encounter a situation where somebody says they have too much of a workspace. So it doesn't matter what we have, Every one of us wishes we had a bigger space. I would like to get out of this space and into a larger shop, but it's not going to happen within the next year or two at the very earliest. Um, so a lot of things have changed here in the shop this year, um, and I'll go into specifics with each one. I'll, I'll turn the camera around and we'll start at the door going into my office and then just work our way around the shop this way. Um, but just to overview real quick, there's the miter saw station and huge storage wall over on that side. Uh, one of my workbenches, these kind of migrate around, always lives right here as the main work surface between um, the main uh, working machines here. And then over on this side, there's uh, we've, we've got a drum sander, my air cleaner cart, CNC machine, dust collection system, and over there is the jointer planer combo in the middle is my table saw router table and the extension wing um that's not a drill press that's a <laughs> a band saw <laughs> and my uh, uh other workbench lives over there and there's a lathe in the corner and some hand tools and some other stuff into this side so <laughs> i'm gonna spin the camera around and get started at the door going into my office on the other side of this door is my office and on the other side of the office is the rest of the house so there is an isolated room that separates the shop from the house and none of the noise that I make here in the shop is unbearable or annoying in the house, which is a plus. Um, and just to throw it out there, none of my neighbors complain about noise. I've got one neighbor, he's quite a far distance away from the shop. So I'm fortunate in that regard. Uh, coming through the office door is my metal cabinet that I keep uh, mainly um, harsh chemicals up at the top, 
like acetone and lacquer thinner and stuff like that. Uh, not necessarily normal finishing supplies like oil-based stains or polyurethane and stuff. Just the harsher chemicals and then the rest of it is long-term storage that I don't access all the time. I don't need access to all the time. Um, this is basically as far as my sticker collection got. I started collecting these stickers a few years back and um, I, I didn't want to clutter up the shop too much. Uh, you can get excessive with some stuff so I've got a box full of stickers that I need to figure out something to um, add to the collection. Over here, um, th this corner is generally uh, you know, it's quick grab and go type stuff, but it's not anything permanent. Uh, step ladder, some jigs on the wall. Um, a mini split is on this wall as well. That is one of the best tools, or one of the best investments that I've added to my shop is a way to heat it and cool it. Um, I live in Mississippi. Winters aren't that bad, but summers are brutal. Um, just under 100 degrees constantly in the summertime with like 90% humidity, it sucks. This allows the humidity to be lowered in the shop and work at a comfortable, it can keep it 70 degrees, but I normally keep it 75 to 80 degrees in here in the summertime. So that's that was a tremendous benefit. Um, I don't know if it's showing up in the video. No, above right here, I'll put another video up or another B-roll clip. Uh, I've got some really high storage on uh, both ends of the garage to have uh, stuff that doesn't necessarily need to be accessed often or clutter from the house like you know Christmas tree and stuff like that I can store it up here at the top without taking up any type of uh, storage space here in the working area down here on the ground uh, highly highly recommend putting up high storage shelves in any working environment that you have extra room near the ceiling so uh, I've got a drill press that is something that I've wanted to upgrade for a long time but haven't necessarily done so. This is a central machinery drill press, 13 inch benchtop drill press from I think Harbor Freight. I bought this a long time ago. There is so much play in the uh, chuck. <laughs> it's, it just doesn't drill straight all the time. It wanders quite a bit and I found out that the table itself is leaning down in the front uh, so I'll have to shim up the pillar back here. I just never got around to uh, making any efforts to upgrade it. I also have one of these benchtop router tables underneath it that doesn't get used often, but when it does, it's very handy to have next to my shop vac and cyclone cart because the dust collection just plugs right in and I can use it, just walk up and use it. Uh, this is all sitting on a, a nightstand that I found in the trash and put some casters on it from, I think, a computer desk. Yeah, those are computer or computer chair casters down at the bottom. So this is all trash and salvaged, but it works just fine. Gets out of the way when I when I don't need it. This is my shop vac and cyclone cart, uh, regular, oversized, like six and a half horsepower shop vac with a clear view. Um, I don't know what it is. It's the mini CV06, I think. Um, on the back side here and all the attachments. This kind of looks like a cluttered mess, but it is uh, an organized state of chaos, I guess you could say. Everything is easily accessible, and my sander pretty much lives on here. I've got it s plugged into an eye socket automatic switch, so when you turn the sander on, automatically turns the shop back on and does the job just fine. Uh, I had a bunch of different hoses on here, but the there's a hose kit from Rockler that has multiple attachments to it that are it's a universal um, I think a universal dust port attachments uh, that come with it and that replaced all of my hoses which is really nice so this lives in this corner it's all powered by this socket right here this this outlet right here which is on an extension cord so I can get anywhere in my shop without having to unplug this thing super super handy to the left of the shop vac cart and on the right side of my miter saw station is this area that kind of doesn't really have a dedicated purpose. The only thing, there's two things that I have, that I, I really want to maintain here no matter what, and that is my air quality monitor and the first aid kit. So uh, I have a Dylos air quality monitor here and I'm not necessarily worried about the 
absolute value of what's in the air. I just use this to occasionally take readings outside and check what what the meter says the quality of air is outside and I try to maintain a better quality of air here in my shop and I do so by um, a pretty good dust collection system as well as an air cleaner cart which I'll show you in just a little bit. So if I'm here, here in the shop this thing is running and it lets me know at a glance the quality of the air here in the shop. Um, I also have a first aid kit visible and it always lives right here. Uh, it used to not always be here. It used to be in this particular drawer right here until I realized I had a friend over who uh, cut his finger not that bad but needed a band-aid and couldn't find one as I stepped into the house. So uh, not uh, having a first aid kit that is not visible and nobody else knows where it's at doesn't really do much good. So it's not a massive first aid kit by any means, but it's always visible and everybody who walks into the shop can see it right here and everyone knows where it's at. On this entire back wall is my miter saw station and more so than a miter saw station, it is a storage wall. That was the primary design element, that, or the primary motivation for designing this was a, a, just a huge wall of storage. And then also secondary to that was putting the miter saw in it so I could have a place to live. Prior to this, I had a bunch of boxes and crates scattered around the shop to store some, to store stuff, uh, which isn't efficient to go through the boxes trying to find what you need. And also it isn't efficient as far as um, just having a bunch of crap in your way. So now everything has a home, now everything has a place to live uh, and it's super convenient. I'd get a lot of questions in regard to the height of the surface here and then also these drawers being up on top, um, not being able to access them easily. Uh, so the work surface, I, I am a short guy, I'm only five foot six, um, but that wasn't, I, I didn't really take that into consideration for the height of the work surface here. This is sized because of or based upon the height of my table saw. So I didn't want any horizontal surfaces here in the shop that I had control over to be taller than the table saw surface just for the ease of use of moving material from one surface to the to the next and from tool to tool. Um, but also it doesn't get in the way if, you, if you've got some odd situation where you need to put a board you know way back here to run it through the table saw or something. Something along those lines. So that's the reason why the, the, the surface here is at this particular height. And as far as the drawers go, I wanted the highest drawer in such a, at a height to where I could see down inside it. So this drawer, for example, I can open it up and I can still see everything inside it. Um, but because it is so high, then you just designate lighter stuff for this height of a drawer. So in this case, I have paintbrushes. This is my painting drawer or painting supply drawer, finishing supply drawer. Um, and then heavier stuff you want to have down here closer to elbow level so you're not lifting it up too high to get it out of a drawer. It's readily accessible. So like this drawer is all of my mechanics type tools, sockets and wrenches and all that, su all that stuff. So it's, it's readily accessible, but you don't have to strain to get to it like the top, or drawer, top drawers if you were going to put something heavy in there. And then reverse, reverse that scenario on the bottom drawers. The stuff you don't use that often uh, and the lighter stuff goes on the very bottom and then the stuff you use more often you just put it at the top so this drawer way down here on top is my main hardware drawer i use this drawer all the time the one right below it is the secondary hardware drawer which could use a little bit more organization all of the uh, drawers in this station are on full extension slides so it's really easy to to get to anything that you need and um, yeah I love this thing so above that is these cubbies which was initially meant for it still is for um, stuff that is used frequently that doesn't need to be in a drawer like drills and drivers or drills and drills and drivers impact drivers uh, use those frequently they don't need to be in drawers drill bits I use those very frequently with a drill press and also with the um, <laughs> the cordless drills and such, so they're readily available. Stuff like that, all my glues and adhesives, some small cutoff scraps. Basically this side over here 
is a little bit of overflow and then this side over here is stuff that I really use all the time. Above that is just miscellaneous storage. I've got a couple boards acclimating for future projects. I tried to keep as much lumber as possible out of the shop and in a storage shed that I have behind my house. Um, if it's just storage for long-term purposes, doesn't need to take up space here in the shop. So that's been very beneficial. Uh, and trash can and some miscellaneous storage down there. And then also you kind of can't see it. Yeah, you can't see it. I'll just move the camera. I had a air compressor down in this corner for the first couple years here in the shop, first few years. And it was extremely loud and obnoxious, so I barely ever used it. I got rid of it, and this was just a dead space for a while. So it's just actually a very, very convenient spot now for smaller panel material for the CNC machine. It kind of looks like crap right there, but it's actually very, very convenient. Um, my rolling st stool here, I was going to make a Lazy Susan of some kind to... Uh, have a lazy Susan to spray finishes on and then I realized that just why not use my little shop stool here it's already purchased no assembly required because it's already put together and um, it does the exact same thing so if you're looking for a lazy Susan to spray finishes on just buy yourself a rolling shop stool and sit on it when you're not spraying stuff with, with it or on it uh, I've got a couple of these uh, rolling top stands so it's got a regular roller on top, and then it's got a, a bearing type roller system that you can add to it. Uh, these are incredibly handy for, uh, I find them really handy for like around the bandsaw specifically, because if you're resawing something that's kind of heavy and long, well, you have to balance keeping it upright as well as up against the fence, tracking nice and, you know, nice and neat to resaw. Um, that's where I've found these to be very, very, beneficial is at the bandsaw. I've got two of these. This is my favorite edition of 2018 as far as productivity goes. Uh, Supermax 1632 drum sander. Having something that in, in just a couple passes can do the, the bulk of all of your sanding has just been such, such a handy convenience. Uh, this particular one has a digital readout that I've had a couple questions about as far as if I like it, I never use it. I just, I just don't. Um, dust collection on it is really good. And the adjustment as far as the quick and slow adjustment is also really nice. So you can quick adjust as well as fine tune. I love this thing. I uh, wish I would have gotten this a lot sooner. Right on the other side of it is my air cleaner cart and the exhaust is on the bottom side on this side and it kind of points up even with this table being in, in place or with it being right here uh, this still cleans the air and pushes that clean air up towards the ceiling which therefore pulls all of that uh, dusty air in the top and brings it down uh, and uh, I, I've done some testing with this as far as its location as far as the direction in which it points it seems to be doing the best job if it's in the, on this wall and in the middle of the wall pointing in this direction um, as far as like cleaning the air here in the shop. It does a really, really good job and that's proven by my air quality monitor. So this is one of those things that I highly recommend everybody make for their shop is a air cleaner cart rather than one of them top mount typical air cleaner boxes that, ever, that a lot of people have hanging from their ceilings. I'm not saying that those don't do a good job, but I am saying that something like this, that not only circulates air around your shop in a circle, but also circulates air top to bottom, bottom to top. This does a really, really, really good job. And it was made with a salvaged furnace, mo furnace, mo furnace blower and uh, so I, I didn't have any money in the, in the uh, blower itself. And then it's just a couple two by fours, some plywood panels and four filters all the way around it. So it moves a tremendous amount of air. It's relatively quiet and it uh, does a really, really good job at cleaning the air. So that's how loud it is. It's not really loud at all. And in the summertime, if you live in a hot climate, it does move a lot of air, so you can get in front of it and use it as a fan. Um, that's been really handy. I replaced the air compressor that I had 
uh, down there with this particular one it's a really really quiet I don't even know what brand it is it's a Eagle brand it's really really quiet well it was already on so and it's got one of these flexible hoses that this this is all I need this will reach just about everywhere in my shop and it's portable enough to where I can take it out in the garage and air up tire or take it out in the driveway and air up tires with it or whatever so this has been a handy little addition rather than having a really large air compressor that I, I would typically not use anyway above my air cleaner cart and air compressor is my finishing supply rack that is probably the oldest surviving shop project that I have to date that was from uh, my last shop and I've moved it around several different times it's just a very convenient little well rack for finishing supplies easy to make too so it's an oldie but a goodie um, and then I've got the dust collection system mainly in this wall so uh, in the very beginning in that opening shot I guess I should have mentioned that I try to keep all of the items with dust collection in one side of the shop and power tools and such and then all of the you know the non power tool type tasks like you know using hand tools or clamping for assembly all that stuff on the other side of the shop so the dust collector itself is can you see it yes it's a clear view 1800 uh, I think that's what it is it's a clear view in the corner back there it's tucked away nice and tight behind the garage rail it's extremely tight and very efficient with space the main trunk comes out a five foot section that is undisturbed to reduce turbulence inside the dust collector and then there is a and this is all six inch by the way the PVC is uh, comes down to this little spider web area that's changed multiple times and then there's the longest line goes behind this this cart along the wall underneath the miter saw station and there's a full six inch port right underneath the back side of the miter saw and that creates a tremendous draft at the miter saw which makes dust collection over there fantastic um, speaking of draft uh, it's very common to get asked questions about using a shop vac for a dust collector and they're, they're two completely different things. A shop vac is a low volume, high pressure suction. So it doesn't move a tremendous amount of air, but it puts a lot of suction exactly in a you know, small location, such as like a random orbit sander or um, you know, any other type of isolated scenario. The opposite of that is a dust collector, which is a low pressure, high volume situation. Uh, relatively low pressure high volume and, and the way that it works is it creates a large draft to pull all of that dusty air all the fine dust that you can't see the harmful stuff out of the air yes it, it you know pulls the larger stuff too but the main thing you want is to pull the harmful dust out of the air you want to create a large draft that you simply cannot do with a shop vac so machines like this this size dust collector stuff like this it's meant for larger dust producing items like a table saw, uh, a larger bandsaw, planer, jointer, um, drum sander. That creates a lot of dust. Uh, so shop vac is much different than a dust collector. Um, from here, we also have the, the main cluster of blast gates. If you have a tremendous amount of line and have the blast gate right at the tool, that may be convenient as far as going up to the tool, opening the blast gate and using it, but you, you have extra strain on the system by it pressurizing that entire length of pipe. So yes, the I still have, I don't know, 15, 15 maybe 20 feet from this blast gate here that's hidden behind the air compressor. Um, 15 20 feet between this blast gate and the miter saw uh, but it allows me to completely eliminate that much pipe from the system if I'm not using that side of the system so the bottom one down here uh, it goes to the table saw station and table saw and band saw this one goes to uh, this side I have uh, a I think this is 28 feet it's one of the dust right expandable hoses or collapsible hoses uh, anti-static hoses this four inch hose goes to the CNC machine and I alternate between it and then the joiner planer combo. It's not the most ideal situation. I'd much rather have everything plugged in at all times, but it's just the way it works out. This is the only way possible for me to do that without making all kinds of crazy connections with pipes. And then this side over here is another 28 foot hose that I use for 
cleaning up the shop, I try to sweep as little as possible because that sucks or just pushes dust up in the air. And instead I use these attachments to clean uh, the surfaces with this brush attachment. And then also this longer piece right here for sweeping the floors or vacuuming the floors, I should say. Uh, and then this also gets disconnected and goes to the uh, drum sander and it just seems to work out really nice over here. This, I'll go to this side over here. This is my Axiom AR8 Pro Plus CNC machine. Uh, I got this in September and I've put a lot of miles on it already. I love this thing. It's in, in respect to some of the DIY type stuff like the Shape Oko and the X-Carve, it's just a different class of machine. And that's no disrespect towards those machines. It's just, it's just simply, it, it, the, the specs are completely, completely different. Uh, and, and it should be, it's in a different price point. Uh, this is a, is, seems to be a reliable machine and the, the use that I've had on it so far. Uh, and it's very, very capable, precise, fast, it's convenient. Uh, I absolutely love this thing. So I, I got uh, the attach some of the attachments like the overarm dust collection thing. If I was to do this all over again, I probably wouldn't get that particular overarm dust collection thing because I didn't realize where I was going to have it here in the shop and if I was going to have a dedicated port to it or something. I didn't realize that the dust collection was going to be right here. So it would have just been more convenient and easy to just drape a line right there. But it is what it is. Everything else about it I love. Um, yeah, that's that. It, and this is kind of in a cluster situation right here. So let me move the camera once again, and I'll show you the limited space, but very usable space that is right here. This area right here between these three tool stations is, it's very, very tight, but it works. And it has to be tight just because of limited space here in the shop. So on the CNC machine, I need to access the front of it, obviously, but I wanted to be able to access the entire length of it over here for, you know, uh, attaching stuff as necessary. So this this space is minimized as much as possible to uh, increase surface area or uh, area in the rest of the shop. Because this isn't like a, uh, it's not a traffic area. I just, just need access on a temporary basis for here. Now on the router table, this is the spot that gets uh, the most compromise as far as this area goes uh, because I, I can still access it um, as needed, but I don't use the router table tremendously. I find myself using the router table most often for very small roundovers or flush trimming, which I don't need a huge work surface for stuff like that. If I was to put a raised panel bit in here, then something has to move, uh, just because I, I don't think I could get a, a full door through here as far as you know cutting it on the uh, on the router table. So there has to be flexibility implemented in this tool layout and there is in the fact that the table saw has a fantastic mobile base so just a couple pumps with my foot it's a hydraulic base it lifts up and this whole thing can slide around as needed uh, the limiting factor there is the dust collection which you can't see it's right underneath my foot um, dust collection is somewhat flexible but somewhat uh, attached via pipe. So I can't go too far with this. This whole setup can go that way by six to ten inches. And then also this bandsaw, it's on a mobile base. So with one foot, it can be lifted up on the mobile base and then moved around as necessary. Again, it's attached to dust collection too, so I can't go too far with it. But the fact that all three of these, well, all both of these two stations can wiggle around. I can accommodate most every situation that I can think of anyway. I've had these machines set up like this for three months and I haven't had to move the bandsaw any just yet. I haven't had to move the table saw any just yet. So it's better in my opinion to plan for the 99% of situations and then also be ready for that 1% of situation, that 1% that may, may come up. So let me drop this bandsaw. Mm, that's always nerve wracking because I wanted access to walk through on this side uh, The bandsaw had to be moved a little bit into the rip capacity of the table saw So as it sits right now, I can get something underneath the uh, table of the bandsaw And I've got about 31 and a half inches of rip capacity as they sit right now Again, the table saw can be uh, lifted up or, and moved that way very easily The bandsaw can be moved this way very easily and I can get to the full 52 inch rip capacity of this saw but I will probably never use the full 52 inch capacity of the saw again because I find it much more convenient to just set up a straight edge and use a circular saw rather than wrestling a large sheet of plywood cross-cutting through a table saw. 
but I do have access to the full rip capacity if needed. Uh, the bandsaw can be moved around very easily with a mobile base. I think I said that. Um, this router table in the wing of the saw is my lever router lift. It's uh, just been very easy to use. With one hand, you can very quickly and easily lift up and lower uh, the bit and use it. So uh, let me move the camera over to there so you're looking at the back side of this little tool island area, uh, seeing the operator's perspective somewhat of the bandsaw. This is the Laguna 18BX bandsaw and it is a, a big step up from the last bandsaw that I had. Um, it's a lot stronger, it's got more resaw capacity, which a full 16 inches of resaw capacity, which I want to maximize with a book matched table project that I'm planning out. Uh, still in the planning stages of. Uh, it's got ceramic guides. I've got a, a Resaw King carbide tipped bandsaw blade on here, which makes resawing like using cheat codes on a video game. It is just, it's effortless to resaw thick material with this bandsaw and this blade. So extremely, extremely happy about this. And really the biggest improvement or the most welcomed improvement, yes, it cuts great, yes, uh, it has a lot of power, but the thing that I find the most uh, enjoyable or the, like the sigh of relief is the, the increased work surface here on the table. There's a lot more material support compared to my last bandsaw and that is just a huge welcomed addition, being able to more easily support your material as you're using the bandsaw. So this table is, is pretty big and it's, it's very much welcomed. Uh, the fence rotates 90 degrees down. So like in this situation, if you don't have much uh, height to cut, the, the, the um, blade guides get in the way of the fence. So you, you don't have but like an inch and a half uh, between the, the blade and the fence. So in those situations, in order to keep the blade guard down, the fence can rotate 90 degrees and therefore you only have the thickness of the fence as your height in that orientation. And there's some stop blocks that are integrated with this fence for operations like you're uh, making tenons, larger tenons on the bandsaw. Then you can set a uh, integrated stop block on the back side of the fence. So there's a lot of cool little features of this fence that I like. Um, and then also that it has a foot break, which you can't see in the picture, but there's a foot break down there um, to stop the bandsaw, to turn the bandsaw off as well as stop it. Uh, and you don't have to wait for it to spin down, uh, which is handy in certain situations. Also have one of these lights up here, which is extremely bright right where you need it. Very handy. Behind the table saw is the folding out feed table, a small walkway, and then this jointer planer combo machine. And this, I, I knew this was coming and it posed a couple issues as far as um, placement in the shop because I've got so much stuff crammed in here. I wanted to have this in a situation where I could have a lot of in-feed and out-feed um, area. It's a bigger machine, so I don't want to move it often. It does have a mobile base, but I don't want to move it often. So this is the prime location for it. It's in the middle of the garage door, and therefore whatever's next to it in this direction has to be able to be moved very easily. That's the outfeed table for the table saw, and it has to be able to fold down, uh, mainly because the guard on the, when you're jointing here, it sticks out quite a bit. And then also the fence as it sits right now is as far as it can go that way at, until it's the garage door. So if I need to have, um, if I need more capacity on the jointing surface, then the whole machine has to come this way by inch or two. And once again, we reduce the walkway right here. So in that situation, the outfeed table needs to be able to get out of the way quickly and easily so I can actually walk through here. So that was, that was the only reason that I wanted to have an outfeed table. Now a lot of people, or a folding outfeed table, a lot of people suggested making my own. But the more I'm out here working in my shop, the less I actually want to work on the shop. I want to be making furniture. I want to be making stuff that I could use, you know, to look at uh, pieces in the house or something. I don't want to be making shop projects all the time. Uh, less and less, the more I would work. So this allows me to um, have a outfeed support for the table saw quickly and easily, and then also quickly and easily get out of the way. The majority of the time it stays up because uh, if the blade guard's not in the way, 
or if I'm planing or whatever, uh, when this is in planar mode, then this is actually a nice little handy horizontal surface to have material, also with the bandsaw as well. So that's the reason why I have a, or I went with a folding outfeed table rather than a uh, stationary outfeed table. Now you heard this click, I added some magnets here to hold the feet up in place uh, as it's folding and that's the only thing preventing this thing from being in my opinion like a flawless design. Just include a couple magnets. Uh, they weren't included but I put a couple magnets on the legs to hold them up and yeah I really like that. So uh, on from that to the jointer planer combo machine, which has generated a tremendous amount of interest. This is the Hammer A341 jointer planer combo machine. It is, like I said, made by Hammer, which is a division of Felder. Uh, both jointing and planing operations share a 16 inch wide cutter head. So that means I can joint a 16 inch wide board and I can plane a 16 inch wide board. When you have a combo machine like this, um, there's no way around it. You gain something and you also lose something. So in this situation, what I'm gaining is the reduced footprint here in my shop. Yes, this is a large machine, but I don't have two dedicated footprints for machines for a jointer and for a planer, and therefore have two dedicated spaces for infeed and two dedicated spaces for outfeed for those separate machines. Instead, it's combined in one footprint. The same infeed and outfeed space is used for jointing and planing. What I lose is the convenience of having two machines set up ready to go at all times for jointing and planing, and I also lose the time it takes switching between jointing and planing. So uh, the convenience of not having both machines set up isn't that big of a deal. It takes about a minute to switch between these two. Again, not a big deal. Uh, the only thing that, the only situation where this it would be a big deal in my opinion is if you have a high volume production shop where time really, really is money in a big way, then at that point, it just doesn't make sense to get a combo machine. It makes sense to get dedicated machines. Um, but also cost, this isn't a inexpensive machine by any means, but the cost of getting, um, a, getting this capacity in two separate mach machines is, is actually quite more. So I looked at the cost of this versus the cost of say like a Powermatic 12 inch jointer. This is a 16 inch jointer and just a Powermatic 12 inch jointer by itself costs more money than the 16 inch combo machine. But anyway, I'll get into more detail on the machine uh, as far as cost breakdown and all that other stuff in a separate video because I have gotten so many questions about this machine. Um, I know a lot of people want to see this thing switched back and forth. Like I said, it doesn't take much time. Typically this blade guard is in place over there. So I would flip it over to here. And then the dust collection port down here for jointing mode, I would take the dust collection hose off, flip it over the table on this side. This lever unlocks the, uh, well, unlocks the outfeed table. This one unlocks the infeed table. And at that point, uh, the fence has to be in a certain position forward so it doesn't bend on the backside of the machine, which it already is. So with it locked down, these two tables lift up. They're connected in the middle with this bar. So if you accidentally let go of one or the other, it's not gonna come crashing down. They are loosely connected. And once it's all the way up, there's a lock down here, which prevents these from falling forward. That's as far as it'll go. So you have to lift this up in order to uh, bring the tables back down. So once this is in the up position. At that point, the dust collection hose will be draped down right here. The dust collection chute or shroud is lifted over the top. I'll plug it in right here. And then the biggest complaint people have with this machine is you need to raise the table up. You can't see it in this image, but you have to raise the table up from six inches to whatever your cutting depth is by turning a hand wheel. Not that big of a deal. And you have to activate the rollers with a little lever here. So Rollers activated for planar mode. Rollers not activated for jointer mode. And with it back down, you can disconnect the dust collection. Flip that back over. Dust collection hose is still hanging right here. Pull this up. Lower the tables. Lock them into place. 
grab the dust collection hose, plug it in, flip the guard back over, and you're back ready to joint again. So you, you do have, like I said, a little bit of inconvenience in the time it takes to switch back and forth. Not that big of a deal. I, I will gladly accept the increased jointing and planing capacity um, than worry about the time it takes to switch back and forth between the two. So I'll have another video on this dedicated to this in the short near future. Next up, we'll go this way in the shop. This corner has always been a clutter catcher in my shop, and I've put forth effort to reduce the amount of clutter that I put in it. So I still keep some of the larger boards for upcoming projects in this corner, simply because it's just convenient to storm there. And by putting my lathe right in front of it, it's made forced me to reduce the amount of clutter that I actually put in it. So this is a Laguna 1216 MIDI lathe. Uh, Laguna contacted me a little while back and asked if I'd be interested in uh, helping introduce their new MIDI lathe. And as you can see, I agreed to that. So this is Laguna 1216 MIDI lathe. And it is, it's a nice little setup. I've used it in a couple projects so far. Um, I'm not a huge lathe turner per se, uh, but it is really handy to have a lathe in the shop. I can't justify having a full size lathe. So this is a good compromise for me. It allows me to turn stuff as necessary, but I don't need the capacity of a huge monster full size wood turning lathe. So that's that. Um, and behind that is my clamp rack, which has seen many different versions. Uh, it's completely full right now. It's at the maximum capacity. If I get any more clamps, which you can never have too many clamps, then I'll probably have to make another clamp rack. And this is, I don't know what version this is, version two, three, four clamp rack video that I've made, whatever. So if I make another clamp rack, odds are I'm probably not going to make a video on it. But it'll probably be the same design where you store the clamps in this direction rather than horizontally across the wall. Uh, you can put a lot more clamps by putting them in, uh, putting them in hangers uh, so they stack out of the wall rather than horizontally on the wall. So that's, that's a definite, um, definite must for a clamp rack in my opinion. And on that side, we go to the hand tool area. So I'll move, let me move the camera real quick. Once again, behind this workbench is my hand tool wall and having them on a wall like this um, does a couple things. Number one, and most importantly, it makes them readily accessible. You can just walk up and grab one and use it. And the, the idea is if you're working on the workbench, everything is within arm's reach, basically, um, right on the workbench. And number two, I make videos for a living, so that just looks pretty cool in the background. Um, so the downside is everything is exposed to dust, which isn't a big deal. It's not going to hurt them at all, but also rust for humidity and such. So, um, I've been thinking a lot about all these tools being exposed and the amount of rust that they're starting to get. And I've casually been thinking about making some type of tool cabinet or something that can close up to where it just keeps the, the, the moisture at bay. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get around to doing something like that, but a bunch of hand tools. I don't use every one of them all the time, but uh, it's fun to, to, to use hand tools every now and then and keep those skills going. So you're not 100% reliant upon machines, which I'll never give up power tools in my, in my woodworking. Uh, the amount of time saved using power tools is a necessity these days, but the enjoyment that I still get using hand tools is also, uh, it's also a lot of fun. So in front of that is the workbench. This is my second workbench. It is all hickory. It's about six feet long and about 28 and a half inches front to back, including the tool well. Uh, I put a tool well on this workbench on the opposite side that I'm typically working on. Love it. I'm going to eventually put a tool well on my other workbench. A lot of people say it's you know a clutter catcher and that's exactly right. It is a clutter catcher, but that's what I want to have the clutter right there and readily accessible rather than on the work surface. So I've got um, marking devices, files, stuff like that, stuff that's uh, mallets um, that, I'm, that I'm typically using with the workbench and it's not in the way up here on the surface and I can still grab it as needed. So uh, this design workbench isn't specific to me. It's just a proven, it's based on a, a French design workbench, very basic, big joinery. Um, instead of mortise and tenon joints on the base, I used half lap joints. They're really, really strong as well. 
pin them with some screws or dowels and they're not going anywhere just the same as a drawboard mortise so the base is easy to make the base connects to the top with a through mortise and tenon connection uh, i've got a video covering the differences between this hardwood hickory workbench and my softwood southern yellow pine workbench they're basically the exact same design on this one I have a tool well, that one I don't. I'm gonna put one on that one. But on this one, I have a shelf down below for a couple of tools that I don't use frequently. A uh, good storage spot for my hybrid Panto router, which is a, a very versatile machine. And then also my um, um, bench grinder. So they can both be slid out and put on top as needed. Uh, the other workbench, I've got cabinets down below. So I'll spin you around and we'll check out that one. This is the very first traditional style workbench that I've ever made. Uh, I'll probably keep it for the rest of my life because it's built to last and I really enjoy using it. It's pine. It's southern yellow pine, which is it's a relatively hard softwood. Um, and I prefer using this more so than the hickory workbench when it comes to the hand tool tasks. Not by much, but I do prefer it because, because of the fact that it's a softwood. So it absorbs the impact more so than the hickory workbench, which kind of bounces back into the tool. Um, I, uh, what, what's different about this one? Oh, I've got a cabinet down below on this one rather than a, a lower shelf on the hickory workbench. And I'm not gonna say one's better than the other because they, they serve two different purposes. I really like the convenience of being able to uh, store some machinery and larger items on the bottom of the hickory workbench, but I also really like the fact that I can put a bunch of stuff in the drawers in this one. There's only four drawers in there. Um, and uh, I, I can't say one's better than the other. They both have different uses. Uh, there is a shallow shelf on top of the cabinets over here, but I can't really put much stuff on it. The best addition to both of my workbenches in this year, 2018, was adding these retractable casters. So with one foot, I can push this bar down. It activates both of these casters or, or puts locks them in the down position. And then I can move these workbenches around very, very easily. So... That leads me to another question that a lot of people ask is how much do these workbenches weigh? I don't care how much they weigh. Um, the, the, the thing you wanna do is not necessarily go for a number, a weight number, but you wanna make sure that a workbench doesn't move when you don't want it to move, but it's easy to move when you do need it to move. So before adding these casters, I could wiggle these around the shop, but they weren't convenient to move adding the casters really made this uh the retractable casters really made it easy to move these around in the shop best addition i've done in 2018 for these workbenches all right that's it for this shop tour i know there's been a lot of changes in 2018 i'm sure there's going to be changes going forward as well uh, all of it in the uh, efforts of continuous improvement so if you have any other questions be sure to uh leave a question in my on my website uh youtube's kind of hard to keep track of everything just because there's so many different videos and such um but Leave me a question if you have one. Uh, if you want to have your shop featured on my website, I'll have a link in the YouTube description or in the article for this video on my website. And that's it. So you guys take care. Have a great day. And uh, see you in the next video.